Today, our armed forces are jointly engaged in a multi-million dollar program for the development of guided missiles. Extensive research and testing is in progress. These programs are designed to provide both defensive and offensive weapons. To effectively use and understand these new weapons, it is necessary to know their basic fundamentals, their principal parts, which are known as components, and the different ways in which the missiles may be employed. Every powered guided missile has four basic components. First is its airframe, which holds the missile assembly. The second is the propulsion unit. The third is the guidance and control unit. This unit, usually electronically activated, is the brain of the missile. The final component is the warhead. These components are basic, regardless of the speed for which the missile is designed. The ratio of missile flight speed to a given speed of sound is called its Mach number. Aerial flight speeds are divided into three zones subsonic, transonic. In the subsonic zone, Mach numbers are usually less than 0.8. In the transonic zone, the Mach numbers are from approximately 0.8 to about 1.2. In the supersonic zone, Mach numbers are usually greater than 1.2. At subsonic speeds, the air flow over the missile is smooth. The configuration of subsonic missiles is similar to that of a conventional plane design. As the speed increases to the transonic level, lambda shock waves begin to appear. The airflow behind these shock waves is turbulent. Drag and buffeting are considerable. At supersonic speeds, added shock waves appear at the nose and tail of the missile. While the speed determines the missile's aerodynamic design, the type of propulsion system is determined by the payload, altitude, and range for which the missile is intended. When going outside the Earth's atmosphere, a missile must have an engine which carries its own supply of oxygen. One of these is the solid fuel rocket engine. It has a powder grain like that of a 4th of July rocket. This grain contains both the fuel and oxygen. The grain is encased in a hull with an open throat at the end. Through this, the products of combustion must exhaust. Burning in the combustion chamber is started by the ignition of an electrical firing squib. Combustion is not explosive. It takes place smoothly and at a definite rate. These gases build up pressure until their rate of escape is equal to their rate of formation. The pressure exerted on the rear of the combustion chamber is reduced as a result of the rapid rate of escape. The pressure exerted on the forward end of the chamber remains more or less constant. The net difference of these pressures is thrust. This jet propulsion is an example of the application of Newton's law stating that to every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. The second type of rocket uses a liquid fuel engine. With this engine, there are generally two propellant tanks, one for the oxidizer, such as liquid oxygen, the other for fuel, such as alcohol. Both oxidizer and fuel are forced into the combustion chamber by a feed system. There are two types. One is the pressurized system. With it, gas under pressure forces the propellants at a regulated rate into the rocket engine. With the second system, pumps force the propellants into the engine. With either system, ignition of the fuel may be by flame or by spontaneous combustion, depending upon the type of fuel used. The result is the same as with the solid fuel rocket engine the creation of an exhaust jet producing a thrust reaction. When a guided missile is intended to operate within the Earth's atmosphere, an air-breathing engine may be used. One of the three principal air-breathing engines is the turbojet. It consists of an intake duct, a compressor, combustion chamber, an exhaust turbine, 
and a discharge nozzle. The turbojet compressor may be started by bringing air into the combustion chamber. Fuel is injected. Ignition is by a spark plug. Combustion is then continuous. In this type engine, the compressor, driven by the turbine, increases the air pressure and sends it into the combustion chamber. The air is mixed with fuel and ignited. The burning gas expands, drives the turbine, and is exhausted. The reaction develops thrust. This cycle is continuous. Intake, compression, fuel injection, ignition, expansion, and exhaust. The turbojet is intended at present for missiles operating at subsonic speeds. Also intended for subsonic speeds is another type of air breathing engine, the pulse jet engine. It was first used by the Germans in the V-1 buzz bomb. It's much simpler in construction than the turbojet since it has only one set of mechanical moving parts, a bank of spring-loaded flapper valves. To start the pulse jet, an ordinary spark plug ignites the mixture of air and the fuel in the combustion chamber. The pressure developed by combustion closes the valves and the expanding gases are exhausted out through the jet tailpipe. When the gases are exhausted, the pressure in the combustion chamber drops until the spring-loaded valves open and admit a fresh charge of air starting a new cycle. The air mixes with fuel and is ignited by the residual burning gases from the preceding cycle. The cycle keeps repeating in a series of controlled explosions. Another important air breathing engine is the ramjet. Its operation is dependent upon the movement of air at supersonic speeds. It is simple in construction and is often referred to as the flying stovepipe. This engine consists of a tube with two main sections. One of them is the diffuser, a duct at the forward end. The other section is the combustion chamber. You can see that when the ramjet is at rest, like this, if the fuel is ignited, the combustion products will blow out both ends. Now let's boost it to operational speed. As the air flows through the diffuser, the velocity decreases. While the velocity decreases, the pressure increases. This pressure is greater at the forward end of the combustion chamber than the free air pressure outside the missile. Fuel is continuously injected into the air stream in the combustion chamber. A flare or spark plug ignites the fuel-air mixture and combustion is then self-sustaining. At operating speed, the compression of the incoming air prevents the hot gas from escaping through the intake. The resulting jet reaction produces thrust. While the speed of a guided missile is affected by its propulsion and aerodynamic design, the flight path or trajectory is determined by the type of guidance system. One category of guidance is self-contained. With it, the flight path is set prior to launching. Once launched, this predetermined flight path cannot be altered. Generally, missiles with this guidance navigate with reference to spatial lines and lines vertical to the Earth. These spatial lines can be derived, for example, from gyros or from the observation of celestial bodies. A second category is called command guidance. With this system, the flight path of the missile is dictated by commands originating outside the missile. One example of this system consists basically of two radars. One radar tracks the target, the second radar tracks the missile. Signals from the target and the missile are transmitted to a computer. The computer, generally located near the launching area, continually compares the location of the missile to the target. The computer determines the necessary corrections and feeds this information to the command radar. This radar transmits commands to the missile in the form of coded pulses. These pulses are used to activate control surfaces and thus keep the missile on the corrected trajectory to the target. 
A third category is the beam rider. With this system, a beam of radiated energy from an automatic tracking radar is directed towards the target. The missile is launched directly into this beam. Electronic components within the missile react to keep the missile continually within the beam to the target. Continuous direction control of a missile is also possible with another category known as baseline guidance system. With this system, two or more radio transmitters are positioned at a known distance from each other. The line joining these transmitters is called the baseline. The launching site is usually located at some point between stations. A theoretical line of position is selected that passes over the target. A second pair of stations makes it possible to establish a second line. The position of the target determines the intersection of these two lines of position. Each transmitter sends out signals either simultaneously or at a fixed time relationship. Components within the missile determine its position by comparing the time of arrival of the signals from the transmitters. By varying the time or phasing of these signals, numerous lines of position may be obtained and guidance direction shifted. Another category of guidance is called homing. For illustrative purposes, it is shown as being used in an air-launched missile. One type of homing is called active. Both radar transmitter and receiver are in the missile. While still attached to the plane, the missile transmitter illuminates the target. The return target echoes are received by the missile. It locks on these returning signals, which, after launching, guide the missile directly to the target. A second type of homing is known as semi-active. With this type, an airborne or surface radar illuminates the target. The target echoes are received by the missile. After missile launching, the illuminating radar continues to direct signals on the target. The missile, in turn, continues to home on the returned echoes. Homing guidance may also be passive. In one system, the missile receiver utilizes the natural infrared radiation from the target. For example, this type is especially useful against any large heat source. The excess of heat radiation from a ship at sea, as compared to the surrounding area, provides a good target. As with the other types of homing, the missile remains locked on the target until impact. For greater accuracy, two or more guidance systems may be used with a single missile. For example, a self-contained system for mid-course guidance and passive homing for terminal guidance. In a missile, warheads of different types may be used. Fragmentation, high explosive bombs, bacteriological and radiological weapons. Each missile is designed to meet certain operational requirements. One of the best known is the surface to surface category. Another is the surface to air. Earliest research was done on the air to surface category. A fourth program is the air to air missile. Of the underwater category, there are two, with the first being air to underwater. The second, the surface to underwater missile. Each of the missiles you will be working with will have the four principal components we have described. An airframe, some form of propulsion, electronic guidance, and a warhead. Regardless of design, these weapons are providing us with new concepts of offensive and defensive warfare.